DVD we are going to show. This is a project done. Can you hear me also in the background? Okay. Um, it's a project from the United States. And Viktor Frankl, when he came to Harvard University in 1962, Gordon W. Allport invited him to come and teach there. He, this, um, this was the time when Timothy Leary, whom many of you might know, he was like a prophet of LSD. Um, when he was trying to, uh, to get his research funded, Leary back then was a, a psychologist at Harvard University. And Allport went to Frankl and said, come to a meeting of the Faculty of Psychology uh, because we are discussing whether Leary should be funded or not. And back then, uh, the saying was, in this, for the sake of academic freedom, Leary will be funded. And the rest of the story you know, because LSD spread like a wildfire, and with it, many of the other drugs, like enhancing consciousness. So, and this was the, the time point when Frankl said, okay, liberty is very good, but we do need responsibility. And these are not two phenomena, this is one phenomenon, actually. Yeah, because the, back si the other side of, actually the beautiful side of freedom is, or liberty, is responsibility. Yeah. So he suggested that, we, that the Americans would um, put a statue of responsibility on the east west coast, on the other coast anyway. OK, so, <laughs> good. Um, on the west coast. OK, but whatever, but. OK. <laughs> Okay. So th this team of people, is a, it's a foundation. They came to Vienna and interviewed Elie Frankl, who is the widow of Viktor Frankl, um, the family, myself, and a few other people, and made, uh, put a film together, a DVD, which we're going to show you, because they sent it yesterday, I think, per express. I can keep on talking, but I wonder where the computer person is. There she is. I want them up, no. <laughs> hmm? The title of my talk is Intoxicated by Meaninglessness, uh, Logotherapy and Existential Analysis for Substance Abuse Disorders, Concepts and Empirical Findings. Um, now, the concepts I will present first, which is to give you a basic introduction into logotherapy and existential analysis, and to make one thing clear in the beginning. I'm going to talk about logotherapy, and I'm going to mean logotherapy and existential analysis. Both are, Frankl said, two sides of the same coin. The therapy, the logotherapy, is a psychotherapy directed towards a person. Existential an analysis is the analysis towards existence, not of existence. Because according to Frankl, existence is something which, which you cannot, it's irreducible, yeah, like time, space. There are certain things which you, since Kant we know this, you can't go deeper. Time is time and, and you can't go, I mean, you can, you can make it into small segments, like seconds, nanoseconds, but they are irreducible phenomena. Existence being one of them and exactly being the ir irreducible phenomenon as such, I mean, you can't go any further. Um, so I'm going to present the basic ideas of logotherapy, um, how they apply to addictions. And they do so in a very interesting way, because in addiction, you have a distorted relationship of man and world. You have a person who is longing for something, who is thirsty, we believe, for meaning, but who tries to derive it in a, in a way which fails the aim of meaning. Yeah? So there's, there's a good intention to experience something and so on, in the beginning at least, yeah? to either experience peace if, if people are taking like sedating drugs, or experiencing um, you know, the richness of existence like if they take LSD or these more consciousness enhancing drugs. Mm. And this distorted relationship between man and world is exactly why logotherapy, addressing both these factors, man in the world, so to speak, uh, why logotherapy is such a good instrument for treating substance abuse disorders. 
just to check in between how far are we here with the DVD. Dennis, is it going? Okay. So to give you the basic definitions in the beginning, logotherapy is applied meaning-oriented psychotherapy, existential analysis, analysis towards existence, again, not analysis of existence. The scope of logotherapy is huge, and later on I'm going to show you a, um, a list of different applications of logotherapy. What you should know is that Viktor Frankl was both a psychiatrist as well as a psychologist, as well as a philosopher. And he was very, very strong in both, in three disciplines, in these three disciplines. He was very good in neurology, he started as a neurologist. Um, he developed some of the very first European tranquilizers. Um, and if you look in the, in the uh, pharma history books, you'll find the name Frankl as being the four, well, the, the, a pioneer, actually, of, um, of the medical treatment of anxiety disorders. He was a psychiatrist, of course, and he was so until almost for over 40 years, actually, in practice, a psychologist and a philosopher. And for those of you who are familiar with philosophy, he studied with Leo Gabriel, who's a famous disciple of Martin Heidegger and Max Scheler. And these are names which are going, going to expound a bit, a little bit on. Um, so, logotherapy as such is a psychotherapy, is or has a motivation theory, a personality theory, a very important one, a theory of cognition, like in cognitive science, a philosophical anthropology, which means it has a certain image of man, an epistemology, I can't this theory, epistemology right here, a philosophy of life, which applies to every one of us, um, is applied in something he called medical ministry. I don't know how, how usual, usual this term is in, in the English language. Um, ministry literally means ärztliche Seelsorge. So ministry you're giving to someone as a doctor whom you can't treat as a doctor. Huh? So if you have a patient who's, who you know will die of cancer in, in, in a few months, you as a, as, a, um, as a doctor and the patient both are facing death. Yeah? You can't heal him, but you can console him. And um, at the entrance of the general hospital in Vienna, there's a, there's a saying which means to heal and to console. And Frankl very, was very fond of this idea, yeah? to, to do as much as you can, but if you can, if you can't do any further, to at least be with the patient. Yeah? And in these situations, you and the patient are both facing existence. In a, again, in an irreducible way, death comes for each of us. And uh, so we are in the same boat in this case, patient and therapist, or patient and doctor. But um, if you have a sound philosophy of life, and that's, that's how these things are interconnected, if you have a sound philosophy of life, you, can, you have a certain trust and a certain strength which you can give to the patient. And, um, good. So can I just ask, how, how are we now? The computer's fine, it's just a projector. It work. Okay, but didn't it just work? No, it never did. It never did work, okay. And you have another projector. Oh, yeah, Emily, of course. All right. So the others know a little bit, heard the name Viktor Frankl, but are not all too familiar with it, right? Is it well summarized? Okay. Hmm? Okay, so since this is, any, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Judy. Uh, what we could do is that I'm going to just talk, and if you have questions in between, ask them, because, it's, because this is a consecutive talk, which means that you have to grasp the basic understanding in order to get, um, you know, to understand more. Okay, 
Now, actually, I wanted to talk about the pedigree of logotherapy, the intellectual pedigree, so that you understand its background. Frankl, as a young student, um, actually as a pupil in school, started to listen to Sigmund Freud's, um, well, started to listen to Sigmund Freud's most famous disciples, Hitchmann and Federer. This was the time when Sigmund Freud was starting to teach at Vienna University. But Vienna University was very strict, and also you should know that these were very anti-Semitic times in Vienna. It was long before Hitler uh, enacted Austria, but still, the, the, it, was in, it was in the air, so to speak. Um, so Freud had a very hard time at university. He never became a full professor, for example. Yeah, he only was an assistant professor, Sigmund Freud himself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, and there, there was something which you don't perhaps have here, which is called Volkshochschule, which is like a public university. You don't get a degree from it, but it's like an open university. Everyone can come, it's evening courses, like, um, this was Socialist Vienna, so called Red Vienna, and it's better times, later it became more dictatorship, like. Um, so, and many of the psychoanalysts understood that you, the university is closed in a way. They don't handle Freud in a very nice way. So they started spreading the news like enlightenment for the simple, for, for the common man, so to speak, um, at these Volkshochschulen. And one of, the, one of the most keen listeners to almost each of these courses was Viktor Frankl. Back then he was 16 or 17 years old. When he was 17, he started to write letters, one letter actually, to Sigmund Freud. And as a big surprise, Freud answered in about one to two days. And that started a very long correspondence between Sigmund Freud and Viktor Frankl. Again, Freud being in his 40s and uh, Viktor Frankl being a teenager, actually. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, these letters don't longer exist because when Frankl was deported, things were taken away from him. And we tried in the archives of the city, but they are gone. In 1922, Viktor Frankl wrote a little article um, about head nodding and shaking and seen through the lens of psychoanalysis, seen actually through the lens of libido theory. And he said, in a way, this is an extension of orgasmic movements, <laughs> and this is of chewing. Yeah? So the yes and the no are somewhat related to very basic instincts, very, very basic instincts. Mm. And frankly, when he talked about it, he used to laugh about it. So these were, but this was his time, and it's, it's good to know that frankly was so much against reductionism later on. Yeah? In his paper, in, in this little article he wrote to Sigmund Freud, said, if we are judging how humans move and whether they say yes or no, we don't have to look at the intellectual content. Do they mean yes or no? But we have to look at lower drives. And this is the very, very faith, actually, article of faith of reductionism, to say, in the end, it might look very sophisticated, but it is nothing but and nothing but is the language of reductionism. Something again which Viktor Frankl in his later times, actually two years later he started, to fight his whole life against. Now Sigmund Freud um, read this article, the little paper, and he wrote back to Viktor Frankl, dear Mr. Frankl, I hope you don't mind, but I sent your paper you sent to me to the International Journal of Psychoanalysis which was the, and still is, the Journal of Psychoanalysis, where it was published two years later, in 1924. Um, why the long time difference, why the long uh, span? Because it was a peer-reviewed journal, and despite Freud being the, the monarch of the uh, movement, still they had to review it a little bit. Two years later, when, when this article appeared, Frankl already left the psychoanalytic analytical movement and was a disciple of, the, of Alfred Adler, founder of individual psychology. Um, and Adler and Frankl, there's a very strong connection between the two, and even today between individual psychologists and logotherapists. Adler, you know, Adler understood the human being as part of a bigger world, namely the social world. Again, Frankl flirted with these ideas, 
but not for a very long time, because also the social world is only part of existence. Hmm? So we start with Sigmund Freud, which is just inner cyclical, so to speak. Yeah? Man is a, is a constant battlefield of what is happening in us. Adler, it's, the, the circle is bigger because it's, it's how, you be, how you relate to others and how you compensate inferiority feelings and so on. Still, it's a small world because we don't only exist in a social world. And Frankl opened it up and said, look, we have to see the human person in existence, which is including our inner battlefield, including our social world, but including things which are not yet there, things which can be, things which can hope for, faith, love, all these things which are not realized in matter, but which do have material substrata, correlator, right? Um, there were two, fa two now unfortunately forgotten uh, uh, disciples of Alfred Adler, Rudolf Allers and, Os uh, and Oswald Schwarz. Oswald Schwarz you don't know perhaps, but you know his work because he is the founding father of modern psychosomatics. And he wrote a book called um, System und Ausdruck der Neurose, System and Expression of Neurosis. And the expression in this case was bodily, like blood, pre blood pressure and so on and so forth. And he was one of these people who, who reconnected body and mind in a time where Sigmund Freud disconnected body and mind. Yeah? Um, okay. And Rudolf Allers, who was a philosopher, who was anti-psychiatrist, who was Jewish by birth, but converted to Catholicism um, because he came to know Edith Stein. Edith Stein some of you might know, he was, she was also Jewish, disciple of Husserl, converted to Catholicism, and was um, sanctified, canonized by the church. Um, maybe also because she was very, very um, virtuous, no, I say tapfer, brave in, in, uh, in the Holocaust, where she died in Auschwitz, she was cast. Um, Rudolf Allers, being, con having converted to Catholicism, moved to Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas, as you know, had a very strong theory of the person. And it's interesting to see that, um, and you know, it's the tradition of Aristotle, Aquinas, and later Heidegger in a, in a very, he comes from the side, he, he enters this. Um, for Viktor Frankl, this was like an eye opener, that his intuitions that our world is bigger and that we are in the world, yeah? And we partake in it, but not only in tangible ways, yeah? Mm. And we, we create in the world because we have ideas and plans which, which are not yet realized, yeah? Which are just in our heads, or in our minds, or in our souls. Um, Alfred Adler, in these times, 1924, was in a very authoritarian phase, and, um, himself being expelled by Sigmund Freud for his unorthodox ideas, but was very careful that his disciples wouldn't spoil his movements. And seeing that young Viktor Frankl and Scheler, uh, not Scheler, and Schwarz and others were moving, were thinking very independently and implicitly criticizing Alfred Adler, um, he expelled these two. First of all, these two, namely Allers and Schwarz, and um, a few months later, um, Adler decided that Frankl would have to leave the individual psychology movement. So he was expelled. And Frankl writes somewhere, since, well, a few months before he was expelled, Adler didn't even talk to him. And they saw each other, and he didn't greet him. And there was a coffee house in Vienna which was bombed by, by well, which was destroyed in the Second World War, um, Café Zilla. And, and Adler and his circle met there. And Adler and Frankl lived actually across each other. Their houses were in, in yeah. Which is interesting. It's, it's, even today it shows the closeness and the, the relatedness, but it's opposite, right? So there, there are similarities, but they are not exactly on, on perfect terms, but on good terms. Mm. Um, so, and it was no, you know, in the, in the Bible, it's the, um, Frankl was considered to be the Benjamin, so the youngest but a, most able disciple of Alfred Adler. 
but this changed in, in a very short time. When Frankl was expelled from this movement, from the, from the Adlerian movement, he started doing something completely different and something which led him into practice for the first time, namely youth counseling. Now you should know that in, 1920, in the 1920s in Vienna, um, the Adlerians made like day clinics for parents. And it was parent counseling. And Frankl himself being just grown up, I mean, 22, yeah, uh, he, he thought something is missing here. You don't have to, only to talk to the parents. What about the children themselves, yeah? What about the, stu the students? I mean, they, they are human beings too, right? So, um, and perhaps they will know better what is, what is, uh, why they are sad or depressed or whatever than their parents would do. And also they're less biased in a way because if you ask your parents, you're asking a third party. So he introduced these youth counseling centers in Vienna. They were free and um, people could go there anonymously. Mm. In, actually, if, if you would, if this would be working, I would show you the, the, the very ancient, what, what we have in the archives in Vienna of, of you know, the first leaflets of, of these um, youth counseling centers. In 1930, uh, Victor, well, what I should say, what I should tell you, you know Charlotte Bühler, Drei, Rudolf Dreikus, August Eichhorn, at least in Europe, these are names when people light up. Uh, these were very, very famous Adlerians, and all of these were voluntary volu volunteers and helpers in Frankl's youth counseling program. So there was split all around the city, there were private flats, centers, there was a day, something like a day clinic. Uh, where people could, where children or young people, stu students and so, could come and be and getting counseled. In 1933, in, in 1930, um, Frankl became aware of a, of a rise in suicide rates among students and, and um, Schüler. What, what is Schüler? So school children. Our monuments can teach us about the ideas that unite us in our diversity. The values that, that sustain us in times of trial. Okay, this is a bit that inspires generation after generation. But, I mean, time is moving. To perform extraordinary acts of service. Okay, but our should we see this now, Dennis? Tell us a great deal about America's commitment to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. The Statue of Liberty is the most recognizable symbol of freedom in the world. Her message <laughs> is essential, poignant, and oh, powerful. Okay. So. Some 40 years ago, the noble definition of freedom was advanced by a man who had lived through the most intense human deprivation imaginable as a Holocaust survivor. His name, Dr. Victor E. Franco. In his landmark book, Man's Search for Meaning, he reasoned that liberty alone was not enough. Rather, true freedom, our freedom, is more correctly the sum of liberty plus responsibility. Freedom threatens to degenerate into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsiveness. And that is why now it's uh, for 10 years that I've been teaching my American audiences they should see to it that the study of liberty on the, on the Atlantic coast be supplemented by a statue of responsibility on the Pacific coast. Liberty and responsibility, two principles that when linked together can inspire, cultivate, and secure freedom wherever a thirst for it exists. Liberty and responsibility, soon to be bookend monuments on America's east and west coasts symbolizing freedom to all people and nations of the world, now and for generations to come. In the 1990s, Dr. Frankel and a small group set out to make the Statue of Responsibility a reality. Since this beginning, Dr. Frankel and one of the other founding members have passed away, but both Dr. Stephen Covey and Kevin Hall have remained firmly dedicated to realizing the original vision. In 1997, they took the decisive step of commissioning internationally acclaimed sculptor Gary Lee Price 
to design the monument. The main message that I would like to depict with this piece is coming together. People coming together in a connected way where all are empowered. I love the design. It communicates almost instantly its message. A brotherhood, a sisterhood, a human family, a togetherness, an awareness we're in the same boat. The Statue of Responsibility represents a message to everyone to live up to what man could be by virtue of being responsible, by making right use of freedom. It shows that uh, this country is not just about self-interest, it's about the greater interest. And as we try to make a society better, we realize that it comes by helping other people. And it's not so much what, what we expect from life, but what life asks you. So that's where responsibility comes in. How do you respond to a situation? The more responsible you become, the greater your freedom and your influence becomes. And then you will become a catalyst for good in everything you do in your life. The Statue of Responsibility is going to be the kind of monument that says to people, we are now conscious of what we need to do to make America and the world a better place. This will inspire individuals, it'll inspire families, communities, it'll inspire the entire country. This is, I think, probably the most inspirational project that's come along in, in a century. So the, the Statue of Responsibility has is now the right time to be, be built. And hopefully people will understand what, what's behind the statue, what is meant by responsibility. The Statue of Responsibility, a compelling idea, timely, enduring, sublime. We invite you to become a friend of freedom to this ambitious cause. Join us in building this beacon of hope, liberty, and lasting freedom complementing the message that emanates from the Statue of Liberty. Join us in building the Statue of Responsibility. Children raised extremely around the time of, this, of, the, of the end of the school year when they got their marks. And again, you have to imagine we are living, we are thinking about a time in Vienna when it was a very authorita authorita authoritarian society. And, um, and these children had no one to talk to. And if you, if you talk to their parents, they would of course say, look, he or she is not going, doing well enough and so on and so forth. So they introduced a, sp a special youth counseling program at the time of the, of the end of the school year. In 1930, and you have to know, it's just really um, everywhere there were leaflets and in the schools and in newspapers and so on and so forth. Through this program in 1930, the suicide rate of students in Vienna fell significantly in 1931 it was the first year for decades that there was no single suicide among school, school children in Vienna. Now, so Frankl really, in these times, collected experiences. Again, moving from Freud to Adler, from Adler to his understanding of existence being more, and if existence is more, the human being is more because we are part of existence. And um, at the same time, this was not only theory because he, he saw in his counseling programs what is moving a person? In 1932, 
And these were, again, just imagine six years later, Hitler would march into Austria. These were very, very, these were thriving years in a positive and negative way. In 1932, um, um, joblessness, work, say, there was a work deficit um, among the young people. And these were the next who came to the, to the youth counseling programs. I would say in 33, Viktor Frankl, he wrote an article then about his experiences as a youth counselor. And this what was what was to become the, I think, the founding stone of logotherapy. Because in this article, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you, he wrote the following. Young people come to us with a variety of symptoms, apathy, depression, addictive behaviors, etc. These young droplets are not so much desperate because they have no work. What they are desperately missing is the feeling to be there for something. The knowledge, so feeling to be there for something, the knowledge that their lives are not devoid of meaning. Which is the basic motivational program of logotherapy, man's search for meaning. Now the therapy. I ask these patients whether life is only meaningful if one works for several hours a day. And then they have to admit that work isn't the only means to be good for something. We are observing, writes Frankl, we are observing a depression which is not so much psychological in origin, but stems from the misunderstanding that to have no job equals having no meaning in life. The counselor or therapist unfortunately cannot change the economic situation of the young people, but he can change their attitude towards it. Um, in, in this small paragraph, there are four basic concepts. Number one, there's a will to meaning, and it's a depression which is not so psychological. Mm. Which is not so psychological. Yeah, oh my. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is not so psychological in origin means, in the language of these days, it's not neurosis in a stricter sense. In other words, it would be normal to be desperate if, if life was really meaningless. And these young people understood their life to be meaningless because they had no job. Um, the third is his question. I ask these patients whether life is only meaningful, and then they have to admit no. This is called Socratic dialogue, Socratischer Dialog. It's a technique where the, or actually it's not a technique, it's really appreciating the dignity of the patient. It's um, inquiring together with the patient, not, not telling him life is meaningful even if you have no job, or there are many other possibilities to fulfill experience meaning, um, but to lead him to the understanding which is resting in him or her through questions, yeah? So you evoke it. You know, Socrates, it, this was, it was like birth, helping, helping a child to come unto us. It's the same with ideas or attitudes. Um, and the fourth is what Frankl called attitudinal values. So the counselor cannot change the economic situation, neither can the patient, but he, he or she can change the attitude towards it, which is our very last freedom, yeah? Under normal circumstances, we can experience, and our life is full of rich experiences, we can do something like creative values, we can act and make use of our talents and create, to give something to existence or to take something from existence. Thankfully, take means to experience, like music, beauty, whatever, persons, to love someone, like to, to experience him in his uniqueness, um, to do something, but if this doesn't work, because existence gives us, doesn't give us the, the circumstances, we can at least have another attitude towards it. And again, about 10 years later, you would find Viktor Frankl in the camp of Theresienstadt, practicing what he's writing here about, not knowing back then what would happen 10 years later. So in this article, you have the basic foundations of logotherapy. The um, 
concept I was just talking about, the freedom and meaning and attitude, actually, and Frank himself wrote, it's not so much psychological in origin, lead us towards philosophy. Lead us towards philosophy um, as an applied discipline. Because again, if, if, we watch it, if we look at the person in the world, we are no longer dealing only with psycho psycho psychological processes, mental processes, but we are really appreciating that we are here. I mean, right where you are sitting, yeah? you are, whether you are conscious of it or not, but you are partaking in existence. And without you, existence would be a little bit poorer. Yeah? And with you, it can be richer. And with you being meaningful fields, or being aware of your, of your abilities, being aware of what life is asking from you, yeah? you can enrich life, you can enrich existence. Yeah? So it's a constant exchange. And this is something which, if, we, if you make a patient, or not only a patient, your neighbor, your friend, you yourself, make aware of, you see that there's a new strength. It's a strength which you, which you don't manipulate into people. It is there. You just, it's like an undercurrent of existence. Yeah? But if you look at it and if you allow it to flow, to, and if you allow, if you allow to com yourself to communicate with existence, then meaning comes up. But again, we are no longer talking about psychotherapy in the sense of that you are treating only sick people. You are talking about you and your life and the life of others you are affecting through it. Um, the same goes for freedom. Um, in psychology as a discipline, and um, I'm doing cognitive science at university and even, there, even more there, you are, we are trying to explain what makes us tick, what makes us move, why we did something. If you understood each and every cause of a behavior, you would take freedom away because then the causes would be enough. You, you, there's no I having the last say, fiat or veto, it should happen or it shouldn't happen, right? Um, so, okay, wait, how is it working? Because, because it, it shows the, the to say that meaning and freedom connect us to the world in a different way. And for the patient, I would say it reconnects him or her to what always has been and what he or she might have lost sight of. And for the addictive person, again, you have, you have a distorted relationship to himself and to the world. And what is this distortion? It's trying to, to get peace, excitement, to get good feelings directly not via meaning, not via choice, not via freedom, but just via bio biological um, mechanisms, actually. Yeah? So you're flooding your brain with whatever, and you get the peace you would normally get, let's say, after a hard day of working, of, doing th of, of giving yourself to the world. Yeah? This feeling of peace you're trying to get directly. And Frankl always said, and this is very important to know, and if you look around in your own life or in your own area of living, the things we are, which we are really striving for are always byproducts. So happiness comes by doing something which makes you happy. The feeling of self-worth is not only a feeling, but the knowledge that I am worth something only comes if I prove myself in a certain way to be worthy of being self-worth, yeah? or just to accept my basic dignity. Um, lust, like, uh, like in physical love, comes because you love someone, yeah? So it's direct, it's, always, it's never directly. You can't intend these things. These are rewards, yeah? These are byproducts. And if you're striving to them directly, what you're doing is you're reducing, actually, man to his basic drives, as Frankl himself did when he was very young, yeah? So you say, don't, forget about the sophisticated, let's say, überbau, like Marx would say. Um, this is only like compensation, sublimation, whatever. So you reduce these things and just go directly for the nectar, so to speak. Yeah? Just if this works, why doesn't the rest work? Because if, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Mm. Okay. 
And there's another thing um, which Viktor Frankl often quoted and which is very important. I'm going to say it in German first. Wo oh, it's the computer. I thought it's the... Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so Martin Heidegger, who is, I think, familiar also in Canada, he said, wo immer der Mensch existiert, wo immer der Mensch ist, geschieht Metaphysik. Wherever man is, metaphysics happens. Yeah? You don't have to do anything for it. It's just you being there, yeah? this Dasein, existence. Yeah? And metaphysics happens. happens. Metaphysics, philo you know, higher philosophy in a way. Yeah? Oh. And um, maybe this will work later. I just noted down a few phenomena which are daily phenomena, which are ordinary phenomena, but which show that we are not talking theory, but we are talking everyday life. To be, to love, friendship, hope, courage, forgiving, being attentive, being interested, like, like giving your mind and your soul to something or to someone. Um, to be creative, to experience, uh, to like something, to be fascinated by something, to tolerate something, which is even... I mean, if, if you try to reduce man, yeah, the, the phenomenon of, of tolerance doesn't make any sense because tolerance means you, you implicitly you did dislike something, but still you endure it. I mean, if we were only lust-driven uh, mechanisms, it, it wouldn't be there. Yeah? So these are small little traces of ordinary life which lead us to what Frankl calls the noetic dimension of man, which is something like a third dimension besides mind, besides body, like, and mind being all these mental processes like cognitions and so on, emotions, something which can handle mind and body, which is, so to speak, in a steering, which has a steering wheel, yeah? And this is where freedom enters. Body and mind, and most of you are therapists, so you know this, body and mind are closely connected. So closely connected that Viktor Frankl uh, termed it psychophysicum, psychophysicum, meaning that where the brain moves, the mind moves. I mean, just have fever, be tired, get drunk, and you see that the, the mind moves where the brain moves, and vice versa, of course. Yeah? Think about something which gives you the chills and, and, the, and your body obeys. Still, these are things which are in, in time and space, and they are conditioned. They are conditioned by our genetic inheritance, predispositions, by our upbringing, by our past, and so on. The noetic dimension is the real me, or the real you. And this is the one to whom these conditions are only material to work on. Let's say that someone is an, um, Frankl said it, in, in German, it's, man muss sich von sich selbst nicht alles gefallen lassen. You don't have to um, obey or you don't have to give in to what you are inclined to do or not to do. So the best example is Frankl himself being, being a mountain climber precisely because he had anxiety of hate, Höhenangst. Yeah? And he really enjoyed it. I mean, in the beginning it was a challenge, but in the, but in the end it was great fun for him. Yeah? And he did it until he was 75, I think. And then he started uh, steering in airplanes. So. so you see there's something which is called the defiant power of the human spirit, something which, which gives you the strength to, to handle yourself, to be a good self-manager. Again, this only works because we are not directly heading towards, um, towards that which gives us sheer pleasure, but because we are, we are going towards that which is meaningful, that which is beautiful, that which, which we can give or take, and as a byproduct gives us happiness. Okay. Hmm. Now, if psychology truly addresses the whole person, the whole person being body, mind, and spirit, spiritual dimension, um, it, it enters into something which is beyond empirical research. Because, for example, Frankl was very keen on saying that the spiritual dimension cannot get sick. 
it also cannot get addicted. And if you're talking to someone who's somewhat addicted, but not, to, not totally you know, given into it, he will have a bad conscience about it, he or she. Why? Because there's a split between the, the body and the mind craving for the substance which gives one peace and, or, or happiness or whatever. And on the other hand, um, there's a spiritual dimension which tells you something is, I'm missing something in life. So our spiritual dimension and meaning, which is out there waiting for us to be grasped, to be realized, yeah, corresponds. And on a lower plane, the, um, on a lower plane, the drives and, and that which is fulfilling corresponds. Just give me a break, I'm going to enduring this. I mean, um, what I just said, I would like to give you a case example, which is, which is very simple, but it shows you that these concepts don't only stand in philosophy, but if applied, and if people are made aware of it, it can really change a lot. Um, now, this is from a case history. Um, an overweight woman, casually remarked that she never could pass a certain candy store without indulging in, the su in sweets and that she didn't even try. So what I should add, in, in addictions or in people who are failing to fulfill their full potential very often deny themselves the possibilities they do have. And many of your patients probably, you just think, well, you have it. Why don't you use it? And if you tell them, yes, you are free and you're a meaning-searching person, it doesn't really work because the, the person blocks it out. But it's very good to take him. I mean, forget about, about just sitting or lying on the couch. Take him out and, and show it to him. So in this case, I, I being not me but the therapist, I interrupted her in the midst of our session and suggested putting on our coats and walking past that store, the sweet store she could never go Besides, we could just as well continue our discussion on, on the street, I told her, and she could see for herself if she had willpower to resist sweet temptations. And she resisted. Very easy. Since then, she walks purposely past that store to prove to herself that she can indeed resist. Now, this is a tiny lesson. It's a tiny lesson, but, it's, but it can have a huge impact. It's, it's not restricted to this one sweet store, yeah? So, such an aha experience, you know the term aha experience? Even if it concerns a relatively insignificant episode, is a turning point. Because you just put a person who's always in a steering wheel, you just put her hands again on, on the wheel, actually, yeah? She's sitting in a driver's seat and you give it, yeah. And this reawakening of, of freedom and responsibility, as you just saw, yeah, can have such an immense impact. Now, and if you have the patient, if, if the patient is that far, the next question is, okay, freedom from or towards what? And that's very important. Uh, Frankl defined freedom as unconditional, and he said it's not that we have freedom, in the spiritual dimension, our noetic dimension, we are freedom. Why is it so important? Because everything you have, you can lose. Everything you are, you are, full stop, existence and you, right? Um, but again, it's not a freedom from conditions. So this woman still has to resist something, so there's desire, right? But she has the strength to do, to defy if necessary, to defy desire, or if, if it's fine, to give in to desire. It's not always abstinence. Mm. This is important, very much important, also in... Um, does it work now or not? What I can say is that there are, first of all, three different concepts of meaning in and of life, which is important because, especially at the meaning-oriented conference, people sometimes 
confuse at least what logotherapy would say. Um, according to Frankl, we have to differentiate between three types of meaning. One is the meaning in life, meaning the meaning of the very moment. Yeah? Something which keeps you in the present, looking at what is in my realm of possibilities, what is in my realm of, of fate, so what can I change and what can I not change. Since it's a freedom to and not a freedom from, the desire is still there, um, and the patient very often is stuck in the realm of fate, of the things he cannot, he or she cannot change. So a patient will come and say, I've got my childhood was like this, and um, I feel unhappy now, and so on. It's okay, and it's true, and appreciate the, the dignity of, of a person who's in trouble, but at the same time as a therapist, move his, his view to his possibilities. And there are many, there are many. He, he's going to you seeking for help. He, he need not, I mean, he could do something else. Um, Mm. Okay, so the meaning in life and the meaning of the moment, which is number one. The meaning of life, which is much more a theoretical entity, meaning something, Frankl said, the meaning of a whole life. And this comes to us, if we are lucky, at our deathbed only, because you can only, understand, Frankl said, you can only understand a film or theater play at the end of it. So when the final cur curtain falls, then you can look back and even situations which at that very moment when you experience them, or the patient experienced them, looked so meaningless. Yeah? And maybe many of, I know this from my own life, I mean, there's so many situations in the, in, in the very moment you don't understand why this is happening to me. A few years later, you meet someone who goes through the same trouble and suddenly you can share something with him or her. Yeah? So there's so many, I mean, even Frankl said in the private, that God can write on crooked lines. Yeah? So, and indeed he can, yeah? or life can, whatever you prefer. Mm. And the third, is ultimate meaning, which is transcendence, which is what many people do believe in, like in a higher entity, be it God, be it existence herself, or him, herself, itself. In logotherapy, in the, in the applied therapy, we are mainly looking at number one, the meaning of the moment. And it's important to differentiate between these because having a faith, having a belief, in a certain way, puts a bracket on your life, in your life, and says everything I experience is in one way or the other meaningful, because I have faith that there's a higher entity and so on. This might be true, but still, even if you are a religious person, you have to manage your day-to-day -day life, and you have to be aware of the meaning of the moment, otherwise you are missing it. If you are missing the meaning of the moment, when, when the final curtain falls, it will be less light spots because you fulfilled less meaning. And so you see it's, um, in logotherapy we are really looking at the concrete meaning. Very often people misunderstand this. Very often people think that if you just give a patient a general feeling that everything in a way is all right or will be all right, yeah? Uh, it's very reassuring, it's very good to know. And, it's, and empirically speaking, there are many studies showing that it's also psychohygienically, it's very good to know this. but. It doesn't release you from, I would say, this higher meaning is a gift. The meaning of the moment is something life asks from you. So in, in order to have a just, a balanced communication between you and existence, you should be aware of the meaning of the moment and the responsibility to fulfill the meaning of the moment. Wow, thank you very much. But how long do I have? Is it 11.15 is it, uh, or 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock? Moving to, towards the ultimate in whatever form, yeah? um, the, less, the less can you grasp it in a rational way. Yes, that's what he said. Um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry because is someone talking here in this room?